Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So today I have a topic radically different from the one presented yesterday. This is a conceptual topic uh, and one that needs to be handled very differently. Um, I, the the mo first thing to do is to situate myself so, because that's really important when talking about the trigger word that I'm going to talk about. So I am white, flamingly white, grew up in a flamingly white community. I am a person who others identify as female most of the time, not always, but most of the time. But I, I do get mistaken, so I'm not someone who's always viewed as a female. Um, but I am someone who has always identified as a female, but especially when I was younger and I didn't understand male privilege, I, I really identified with male things. Uh, I, uh, through my sister largely, my big sister kind of made me, in many ways, she's more important in my life than I am. Um, maybe some of you have older siblings who have also been very influential. <coughs> so that's, <coughs> sorry, that's my background. Lower middle class, um, largely rural in my background. So on this topic, where we come from really makes a difference in how we see it. Now, the other thing I need to say is that I have been engaged for at least a couple of years in studying sexism in the movement, sexism and male privilege in the movement. So it has been something I have been intensely involved in. <clears throat> and uh, actually putting a book together that is now going through the process, it's called Oppressive Liberation. So that tells you what I'm finding. Um, and what that study has been all about. And there's, I, I did surveys on it. The surveys are involved with it, which you can find if you would like to take the survey. It's at uh, canhad.org. Uh, you can find the survey there, and you can also do testimonials on that site. And that's been important part of the research. So it's something I have been very involved with for a long time, is sexism in the movement. But it's been a process, like everything else. And it's been a door that's opened that has helped me understand all the interconnected problems and how they're connected. Please come in. Please come in and make yourselves comfortable. And, uh, those who are near the door, please welcome people in and everybody try to help find room for people to be comfortable. Yeah, we have a seat. Anyone who needs a seat in particular, please. Anybody who needs a seat? All right, so the trigger word that I am going to talk about is, is rape. And I'm going to try to use the word as little as possible, um, and, but you will know that that is what the talk is about. And I'm going to focus on the analogy that is used. So that is my focus. So my concern with this is that the movement has been using an analogy between women and animals. And remember, I use animals rather than other, rather than terms normally used are other than or non-human animals. And I don't like these terms because they are othering. And I do not like the term animal because it denies that I am an animal. And humans use this and they forget that they're animals. So I use the term animal, and it allows, uh, it prevents othering, um, and it is also one where if a chimpanzee were to sign, or a parrot were to speak, they could use the term animal, and I would be included with all the other species. All of us would be part of all the other species, and the parrots or the chimpanzees would be the ones who were outside the circle using the term animal. So that's why I use it. <clears throat> so. We use this analogy, and I think that it just requires some careful scrutiny. So that is what this talk is about, is the analogy that we use and why I think that it's a really bad idea and we need to not use it. And I'm leaving lots of time at the end so that I can get different points of view on the table and we can discuss, uh, we can discuss the topic. I think that's a really important thing to do because 
especially on this topic, points of view are very situational. It very much has to do with who we are, where we've been, where we come from. As a philosopher, we use analogies quite frequently. But in this case, the analogy is not apt. Now, the way you tell if an analogy is apt is the closeness of the comparison. So it's pretty clear to me that this is not uh, a very close comparison. One thing I want to point out is that the background of what I call the Greco-Roman diaspora, which is those who kind of look back to the Greek civilization, is that we are very Christian repressed. So we have this really weird relationship to sex. And it's not so true among young people, and it's not so true among liberals, but it's kind of part of the culture. So we just kind of have to be, kind of keep that on the table, just kind of as, a, as something to be aware of, that our relationship with sex is affected by that, uh, by this background, the patriarchal notions and just sex repression of Christianity and, and uh, related religious traditions. The strength of an analogy is, reluted, is uh, rooted in the parallel cases. So is it really similar? So if we talk about the artificial insemination of a cow, for example, which is frequently in the movement referred to as using the R word, the question is, is that really even an apt analogy? So it's clearly not a sex act, right? It doesn't even require the genitals on the part of the person doing the act. So from a philosophical point of view, this is not a close parallel. Uh, there's no sexual pleasure generally involved. Now, of course, you can't really know, but the idea would be that there's no genitalia involved, and it's something that is done repeatedly. Anyone who's ever seen this uh, online, you know, the arm is stuck clear into the cow, and they just do one after another. Um, and if you've ever seen a herd of cows, that's a lot of cows to artificially impregnate when it is done. So. This is not something that um, this is not something where the analogy holds. All right, so that's my first comment. Um, there is something on my computer that is needs to go away. Thank you. Go away. All right. Now, in among humans, we talk about this as an act of dominance. <clears throat> All right, but I, I question. Now, we, we, can't get in, we can't get into the heads of other beings, and we don't want to. Please come in. Everyone, please help everyone to come in that would like to come in and be part of this so they can join our discussion later. <clears throat> but what can this mean with animals? What, I, I know that, for example, I want to use my dog Mango as an example. People who work with dogs say that humping is a dominance act. I've never studied it, but I'm pretty sure it's not. I've got dogs. Humping when the dog comes up and kind of thrusts the, yeah. <laughs> now I have a little dog, Mango. He, he is about as non-dominant as a plant. In fact, I think the garden plants have precedence over him. And I have a very dominant dog who never humps. And I just don't see this. What I, when I see this act, they're excited. Uh, and some dogs do it and some don't. And I just, you know, where are the studies? Is this not just, again, part of our culture that sees something that is associated with males and decides that's a dominance act? That's what I suspect. And again, it isn't something I've really looked into. But I do have dogs and have had a lot of dogs and been dog, around dogs a long time, I do not see this as an act of dominance. If that's the case, I'm not seeing it. <clears throat> and I think mango is about the best evidence I've got. When a cow is forcibly impregnated, we can't know what she experiences, or a turkey. We can guess it's uncomfortable. We can be very sure they would not prefer it. Those things I think we can know. But to implant on that anything that comes from our sense of sex and sexuality, that I don't know about. I, I think, again, this is where I kind of look to the Christian repression and our whole views of sex, and I, I just don't see it in the animal, in the, in the larger animal world. Uh, I don't see it in animals. All right, so th this is where the analogy doesn't work, 
And I think when an analogy doesn't work, we shouldn't use it. The comparison isn't there. And I think these are rather deadly, if you will. These are the, the fact that it's not a sex act and there's no genitals and there's no pleasure and the fact that if we really question what it is that animals experience in this, I think the analogy falls right there. And in the philosophical worlds, it would. This is not an analogy that's going to hold water. <clears throat> Here's another critical point from us as the world of activists. I think that the analogy can be hurtful. I think that that the way women relate to the R word and the R analogy is very different than, I would have to say most women and most men, and how they relate to it is going to be very, very different. And I think that people who have not experienced sexual assault are not going to relate to this analogy the way, I don't think it, I know it. If, the, if you have never been sexually assaulted, you are not going to relate to this analogy the same way as someone who has. And the problem with this is that generally it is women who have experienced sexual assault and uh, it is a lot of women and in comparison men have comparatively not experienced rape and even when they do, now depending if it's a male or female, women are almost invariably raped by someone who is in a dominant position to them and not the same sex. So that's a unique experience. If a man, for a man in any case, it's not, it is not going to be the same in that way, generally. Not to say that they can't be raped by somebody who is dominant, but not a whole class that is dominant. They are part of the male class, and if they're raped by a woman, it's not a dominant class. So it's a different experience. <clears throat> and the fear for me on this is that this could backfire. Uh, that, that, that this sense of dominance that can come from this experience can be something that for men, uh, it, it, isn't, it, it isn't something that speaks against animal exploitation, especially, now, I live in a ranching world. I live in a world where men, if you told this to the average man on the streets in Montana, you're not gonna do anything to help the movement. I can be really clear on that. So knowing the audience, knowing who you're talking to, uh, in a privileged, in a male privileged world of exploitation and dominance, this analogy is, if anything, it may feed into that. It could encourage the dominance over animals in order to, as part of that male dominance. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> Another problem with this analogy is that when we other, when we denigrate, when we marginalize, one of the things we do is we compare with animals. This happens to people of color. This happens to women as two examples. Uh, here's an example, uh, and if you, if you watched the presentation yesterday on sexism, you saw lots of these types of ads. <clears throat> Carolina's presentation on uh, sexism, why feminists should be um, vegans or animal activists. So, um, Equating oppressed groups with animals is a very old habit and one that we certainly, I assume, don't want to feed into um, or need to at least be very careful with. And I think we don't want to feed into it, but being careful with it. So we see this like language, definitely others. We see advertisements like this one that equate women to animals. We have laws uh, down through history, especially older laws where women were property, where they controlled nothing, not money, uh, not the children, that men controlled everything, so laws have backed this up, and we have relationships. Words like uh, animal husbandry, right? What a term, right? Uh, husbandry, the idea that the man, the husband, is in control, and both of the wife and of the animals. So um, watching for problems that come from, from these types of relationships. So this, in, this analogy feeds into all of those historic ways of relating oppressed or marginalized categories with animals. So when we use the R analogy, we are doing the same thing. We're saying that women and animals, the same thing happens to them. 
So because of this history, I would question whether or not we ought to be doing that. In my study, one of the things I find, and I find that there's a lot of problems with sexual assault in the movement, especially in my country, in the United States, but in the survey, which is from all over the world, it's happening everywhere. How many of you are from a movement where you would say that male dominance in the movement is a problem? Please raise your hands. Okay, and most of you are from, uh, how many of you who raised your hands are from Europe? Okay, so you're having similar experiences. So the male dominance and what comes with it, the sexism and then the sexual assault is problematic. One of the problems is that males and this, again, it's a long history of this, um, of the women began uh, the movement. Women have been the f core of the movement. Women form, to this day, 80% of the movement. So m men were the minority, and yet in sexist cultures, male voices are the voices that are heard, as women were not heard. So the movement recognized that we needed men. And some, and I know Peter was one of the groups that did this, purposefully looked for men to be spokespersons. Right, so this is an example of a culture that is sexist and a movement that's in it and a movement that hasn't figured out that we can't be part of that, that liberation is either total or it's not at all. So as a need of trying to be heard, men were invited in, men were rare, to this day there's less of them, to this day they're held in more esteem. There's many young women in the movement and the men are sometimes using it as a situation where it's kind of a harem, where they're almost like they're honored and the women are, there's not very, men to very many men to choose from and they're looking for relationships and it becomes a very dangerous situation for women in the movement. This is a fact. This is happening. This is what my studies show. So this is not hypothetical. It's very real. And it may not be true in your specific community, but generally it is true. What this leads to is a heroizing of men where they get yet more powerful because there's lesser of them, their voices are needed, there's more women in relation to men. Um, and, and any way you look at it, this is going to empower men. And they're often viewed as heroes. So when we use the R analogy, we create, we further that, so that the male heroes can be the heroes of animals who are being oppressed in this way by men. Do you understand me? Is this making sense? Okay, so uh, when we use this analogy, we feed into the men, the males as heroes rescuing the females, and it can even legitimize acts of violence. And uh, in this way, and it's something that disturbs me is when I see younger males especially who tend to engage in illegal acts more than females statistically, I don't like to see them in prison. I don't want to, in my country in particular, I want the activists on the street. I want them doing things for the movement, not making one brash act and then spending 10 years in jail. So this can be hurtful to those who identify as the heroes as well as to the movement more generally when we have heroes that are elevated above others. One of the things to me that is very upsetting about this to me is that it allows perpetrators in public to re-traumatize survivors slash victims. So if we're using the R analogy and we often have empowered males speaking, so the very people who are sexually assaulting women are given a chance in public to bring up the R word can you imagine what that's like for the women who are the victim survivors that are sitting out there? This is not okay. So for this reason alone, this is simply not okay. This reminds victims and survivors of their power and dominance, and it can really be triggering for the survivors and the victims. So here's another, the fifth reason why I think this analogy needs to be let go. So remembering that in my country, every 2.5 minutes, someone suffers from sexual assault. One in six women have suffered from the R word, and the movement is 80% female. 
put those statistics together and see whether or not you think this should be a word used at least in the United States where these statistics come from. But I don't think these statistics would be radically different in other places, but I don't know. So we have to ask ourselves as a movement what we, who we are and what we want to be. Are we a movement of compassion? Are we a movement of total liberation? Do we want to use analogies that can trigger others, that can harm others, that can backfire and harm the movement? And the final thing I want to say is, I understand as a philosopher the importance of analogies and their power. But there really, there, there really is no need for an analogy for animals. What they suffer is uniquely horrible. And I think that, that describing those acts and getting information out there as to what's really happening to farmed animals, it stands on its own. Why muddy the waters with this kind of analogy that can re-trigger and harm people in the movement, as well as those, it can even prevent people from coming in the movement. And, and in my research, I found some who came into the movement were like, whoa, this is not okay. I don't want to be part of a movement that behaves in this way. So as part of growing the movement and being open, this analogy, for at least these six reasons, and I'm guessing there's more, needs to be set aside. With that, I want to open to conversation. <laughs>